stupidity is doing the same thing over and over again while expecting different results. And we are all guilty of it, including myself, that is. Now, I know it's not ideal to start a talk by insulting your audience. <laughs> but let me explain, bear with me, because it's not really an insult. I am a social entrepreneur, and I'm here today to talk about our politics. But before I start, let's take a vote. Please raise your hand if you are concerned about the current state of our politics. Full house, I might as well just leave. <laughs> now, raise your hand if you, like me, um, agree that our politics and our government is not responding to what's important to you. Well, it turns out Americans agree with you. Because according to a recent study, only 17% of Americans say they can trust the government to do the right thing most of the time. Only 17%, less than one in five. That to me is worrying, because if you flip the numbers, we're talking about 83% of Americans not trusting their government, and that includes the vast majority of Democrats, Republicans, Independents, and those who didn't vote. Public trust in government has reached an all-time low since 1958. And it's not just an issue of trust. We currently live in an age of extreme polarization. As a matter of fact, America is now so divided that the only thing we can agree as a nation is that the nation is divided. <laughs> so we can all agree things here are pretty screwed. But you see, this phenomenon is not unique to the US. Because if you take a closer look, every nation in the world is disillusioned and disengaged from politics. Let's take Asia as an example, where I come from. Now, in my home city of Hong Kong, one of the wealthiest cities in the world, we have just witnessed the largest civil disobedience movement in recent history. Public trust in the political system has plummeted. And by the way, when I say trust in the system, I don't just mean the government. The man you're seeing in the photo was a former opposition legislator. You see, people in Hong Kong have now lost faith in the government, in the opposition, and everyone in between. So this trust and polarization has prevailed. Now, similarly, in Myanmar, an emerging democracy in Southeast Asia, the country has witnessed its first democratic election of recent times in 2015. Now, the turnout at that election was at an impressive 70%. And yet this year, when the country held its first ever democratic municipal election, the turnout was a mere 15%. Now, compare this 15% with 70% four years ago. You know you're in trouble. Now, those who didn't vote say they were unhappy with the performance of the government. Nothing will change even if we voted, they claim. Now, if that sentiment came from Michigan or Wisconsin or West Virginia, you can sort of understand but coming from a new democracy after decades of popular demand for the right to vote, you know you are in real trouble. So what do these trends tell us? Well, irrespective of history, context, and the type of government, distrust and polarization are endemic. Our politics is paralyzed, it is toxic, rigid, and unresponsive. It is not functioning, and it requires fixing. And to fix it, we can't just be treating the symptoms. We have to look at the root causes. So we have to really fundamentally rethink how our politics work. And one way of doing that is by constantly testing new ideas, new systems, and new models of governance. We really have to shift that compass point and anchor it in a whole new direction. Now, remember when I showed you this photo earlier. When I 
first started my career, I witnessed the height of the Occupy movement as a young graduate. Now, I know many of you say I'm still fairly young, but in 2014, I was far younger and far greener, and I was immensely passionate about driving social change. But I had an imminent decision to make whether to work inside the government or outside. Now, in the end, I chose the outside. I chose flexibility because I wanted to work on innovative solutions. And so I joined a think tank. But after some while, I heard some laughter there. After some while, <laughs> I realized, like you, that I wasn't really on the outside. Because, you see, think tanks are also part of the status quo. Think tanks are part of that political ecosystem that tends to react to our symptoms. All this while, I was harboring quiet hopes of that compass shifting, little by little. But eventually, I realized in order to do so, I first had to shift myself. And so I decided to go to Myanmar, and that's how I became the accidental social entrepreneur. <laughs> now, meanwhile in Myanmar, the political compass was gradually shifting, little by little. Following the 2015 election, hopes were really high. Communities gradually called for change. And as a new government was ushered in, it became clear to me that my long yearning for creative, innovative solutions in rethinking politics could, after all, actually be realized. My team and I started to engage with local communities, because in order to best learn about a country, you learn from its people. And one thing we learned was that the, the country had a problem where there was a gap between the government and the citizens. Let me give you an example. This photo was captured in a rural township called Tuante. When we held town halls and engaged with local villagers, we learned that the community really wanted to build a fence around a water pond. Now, this was no ordinary water pond. This was, in fact, one of the only few sources of drinking water of the entire village of 4,000. And the villagers wanted to build this fence to prevent livestock and animals from entering and contaminating their water. But you see, the problem with this is a small infrastructure gap like this is too small for the government to detect, while too big for the people to ignore. And there, we started to think about how we can create a system to help the government react and respond more swiftly to citizen needs. Now, what was that bright idea? Harness collective action. And here is how it works. So we would start by crowdsourcing funds from local citizens in order to enable them to take ownership of the development of their community and to select what are the priorities of their neighborhoods. Now, the funds would then be loaned to the government because while we know that citizens had the bright ideas and the local knowledge, it was the government that had the capacity to get that fence built. And in doing so, not only were we able to harness local participation, elevate local demands, and get them heard effectively, we were also essentially able to bridge that gap that I spoke about between the people and the government. Now, when, when the fence is built, the government will be expected to repay citizens for their contributions in full. And this cycle of people to government and government to people was precisely the shifting of compass that I long dreamed of. Oh, and by the way, this was the fence we built. A small demand the community had for years, we built it in a month because we had the, uh, the citizens' backing. Now, what's my point here? Well, my point here is that sometimes some small and simple shift in the usual course of doing things could turn out to be the better way. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that our model is the model. And no, I don't have all the solutions. And no, I don't claim to have any prophetic epiphany, magical power um, of knowing what's, what works. But at least we did our little part in testing. And we 
have to be constantly testing new models at greater pace and at greater scale. Because the truth is, our civic and social innovation is seriously lagging behind our technology innovation. And so we have to give social innovation a chance, and we have to give our social innovators and entrepreneurs the due recognition they deserve in our formal policy-making process. Oh, and yes, by the way, just as our greatest inventors require venture capital, our social innovators require venture philanthropy and testing grants, and above all, your curiosity and support. Because stupidity is doing the same thing over and over again while expecting different results. So if we really want to shift that compass, and if we really want to make our politics more responsive, well, we better start doing things differently. Now, at the beginning of my talk, many of you, probably all of you, indicated that you were thinking about politics. Well, I implore you, don't just think politics, rethink politics, because otherwise, we run the risk of stupidity. So I hope you will join me on this quest in testing new models. Thank you very much.